right. Let's make sense of what we just read. this complicated diagram. Um, there are a lot of vocabulary here. Let me elaborate on some of them. Okay. Um, there are three new words that you are coming across, or maybe four. Okay. Let me elaborate a little bit on all these parts. Okay. Right. So broadly today, we're going to cover a few things. Number one, how does water get into the xylem from the roots? Okay. Number two, how does water travel up the plant? Because that's the important bit. That's the part that we are trying to wrap our heads around. How is it possible a tree can get water from its roots all the way to the very top leaves? Okay, let's begin with number one. In your notes, you probably encounter a diagram like that. And uh, I'm trying to replicate whatever is on the screen. Except I've included one more section. I've included a root hair cell. Just to orientate you, this is where I'm drawing. If this is the root with all the hairs coming out, I sliced it, and this is the cross section, and then I zoom in. So what you see over here is just one of the hairs sticking out. Yeah, you see this part over here? It's like one of the hairs over here. Right, so we zoom in. Okay, so you see that there are three different pathways that water can move. I'm going to orientate you on what all this means. First pathway. Maybe you look at the second one first. It says transmembrane root, bio water channels. Okay, the word transmembrane simply implies that it moves across membranes. Okay, so let me orient you to this diagram. Everything that's black are cells. Everything that's red is the cell wall that surrounds the plant. Cells. Okay, so you notice that there are a lot of cell wall in between the plants, the plant cells. Okay. So number one, first route that water can take is the transmembrane route. When water gets absorbed into the root, it can travel across membranes of cells, across the membrane of cells, and then eventually into the xylem vessel. Okay. That's route number two, or number one, whatever you prefer. Okay. The transmembrane route. So maybe I label this as number two. Yeah? Trans membrane. The first route is, and the, the third route is interesting. Okay? You know that at many parts of the plant, the cells are actually connected cell membrane to cell membrane. Okay, you see the word plasmo desmata, which simply means a connection between two plant cells via the cell membrane. So I'm going to show you what it means uh, right now. You see this root cell over here? And then you see this cell next door? Okay, I'm going to erase this part away. I'm going to connect them via cell membrane. Okay? A lot of the plant cells actually function this way. They actually have these things called plasmo desmata connections of cell membranes that allow substances to move from cell to cell at a much faster rate. Okay, so let me label this the plasmo desmata. And water can also move through this much more easier route. So if water were to enter the root cell, root hair cell, they can travel through the plasmo desmata, through the plasmo desmata, through the plasmo desmata, and into the xylem, where water will get transported up to, the, to other parts of the plant. Okay, and that's root number one that you see inside your textbook. That is the same plastic root. The last route is not quite what you expect. He it says it's just simply described as an apoplastic root with porous, uh, with porous cell walls. Okay. This last route is interesting. Remember that the cell wall is not like an impermeable layer. 
which has a lot of cellular fi cellulose fibers like mesh, water can still flow through it. Okay, it is porous, this layer over here, the cell wall. So, water can actually travel along the cell wall. Yeah, I'm going to hop over here. Oh. Okay. So, it can actually travel through the porous cell wall. And this would be route number three. That's the apoplastic route. So like, if you think about it, in between these plant cells, almost like they are drainage, right? Like, like you know what locums are? Yeah. They are like locums. Water are just flowing in between the cells. That's where all the cell walls are, okay? Because cell wall is porous. That's one thing we should think about. The interesting bit is that eventually the water traveling along the cell wall needs to still enter the cells before going to the xylem. Because if you see that yellow strip over there that's labeled the Casparian strip, which on the white board is this part over here, Casparian strip. This strip is waterproof. Unlike the unlike the cellulose in the cell wall. So uh, actually when it hits this waterproof layer, it hits a roadblock. And the water has no choice but to move from the cell wall back into the cells next door. Okay. There's a roadblock here for the waterproof roadblock. And then it will still enter the xylem after pitch. Okay, so three different pathways that water can take to enter the xylem. Now let's have a thing. We look at the first question of today. Can you suggest how the water and the solutes in the apoplastic root, which is the water that was moving along the cell wall, can you suggest how they enter the plant cells? after they hit the Casperian strip. What processes do you think the water will go through in order to enter the cells after it hits the waterproof road block? Okay, could I get you to key in some response and then we have to look at what everyone thinks. What processes, right, when we think back to transport uh, across membranes, what processes do you think allow the water to move back into the cells after it hits the Casparian strip. Responses soon. Okay, don't need to type full sentences. Uh. Some bullet points will do, and then we can see what you're thinking. I think one way we can link back to previous topics would be transport across membranes. Yeah, after all, plants, every cell that we know of is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. Now we have a problem. We want the water to get back into the cells. Okay, let's have a look. 
Okay, as we scan across, we see that Debbie mentioned that water might move in via osmosis. That is possible. Yeah. Actually, that rule of thumb, lah, as long as you see water, you want to bring in the idea of osmosis. Right? That's how water primarily moves. Okay? Uh, Brian says osmosis. You think brought up something a little bit more specific? That there are aquaporins. Possible, right? We know that aquaporins can speed up osmosis. Allow osmosis to occur at a much faster rate. Okay? So that was a little bit more in depth. Okay, diffusion through the endodermal cells. Okay, uh, diffusion, yes, for things like the solutes. So when we think of water moving, you might also want to think of two things. Okay, there is the water, and then there is the solute. Remember, right, the solute in... Okay, solute are things like the salts. Those things, are, we would say, they move via diffusion. Okay, but for water, Words like osmosis are the uh, terms that we often use to describe movement of water. Okay, so if we scroll down, we see uh, more water moving by osmosis. Mention of water channels. Oh, this is green. Huh? How do you do that? Okay, so well, you can change the. Okay, osmosis. Oh, you also don't know why your font is green. Okay, all right. So a lot of us mention osmosis. Uh, Rafu over here talked about water potential. Yeah, at the end of the day, water is moving by osmosis because there's a difference in water potential. Okay. So that was a quick understanding of how gets, water gets into the xylem. For the remaining parts of the lesson, we're going to look at how water moves up the plant. Right? First, let's begin with something quite interesting. Let's begin with capillary action. Uh, I don't know if it's your class that mentioned that water could move up via this method. If you ever experienced this, when you take a straw, in the moment you just put it on the tip of the water, you can you are able to, after you lift the straw, you see some water will have stuck onto the base. Yeah? Like if you just dab it, right? And then you lift it up, you see the water cling onto the base, right? Why? Why is water able to do that? We think back to last year, you learn about the properties of water. What makes water sticky? Able to cling onto the sides, cling onto each other. Sorry? Adhesion. Remember the words adhesion? Cohesion. Okay, there's a difference between those terms, huh? So if I have lots of water molecules, cohesion is the attraction of the water molecules to each other. Adhesion would be, let's say this is the walls at the side. Adhesion is the attraction of the water molecules to the sides of the walls. So there's a difference between those terms. Adhesion and cohesion. What, what are these bonds that are causing the water to stick to each other? Okay, we, we think back to last year, hydrogen bonding. Because water molecules are polar after all. So the basis of all this stickiness is nothing more than hydrogen bonds. That means to say, uh, if I have a straw whose side walls right, are hydrophobic, actually, will you be able to suck through the straw? Hydrophobic. If you have a hydrophobic straw, the inner walls are hydrophobic. Do you think you can suck through the straw? No? Yes? Okay, actually I saw a YouTube video recently. Uh. Do you know this dude called Action Lab? Oh, Action Lab. Hydrophobic straw. This guy went crazy, you know, like ever since he got hydrophobic paint, right? He started painting everything he can find hydrophobic paint. Okay? Can you drink through a hydrophobic straw? I found this quite interesting. You won't be able to bring a vacuum to suck it up. In order to turn this into a hydrophobic straw, I'm going to be coating it with fume silica. Now, fume silica has a cool ability to make anything that it touches hydrophobic. So I have some water in this cup. I'm going to dye it red. Let's see what happens when we drop water through our regular straw here. So it's about what you'd expect here. Kind of just fills up the straw and dribbles out the end. This is quite sticky. Now let's check our super hydrophobic straw. 
Whoa. <laughs> you see the drop shoot out of it? <laughs> they have almost no friction going through there, so they just shoot out the air. Notice the water comes out as little droplets. Cohesion is still there, but the adhesion is gone. Now let's see what happens if I try to plug up one end of it. It won't stay in the tube. Look at that. I'm sure a lot of us have done this before, right? When you, when you drink something and you cup on the top. The only reason it's staying there is two things. Pressure okay, and also adhesion to the sides. Easily stays in. Let it go for it to fall out. But the hydrophobic straw, you can't plug it up. The water just falls out. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, the xylem vessels in plants, they're not hydrophobic. They are, in a sense, also made of materials that allow the water molecules to adhere to the sides. But here's the beauty of uh, tubes. If you have tubes that are not hydrophobic, allows the adhesion to take place, Something happens when you make the tube smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? And that process is called capillary action. I'm going to show you a video now of someone that compared different sizes of tubes and he placed it in water. Where was the video? Ah, there it is. I would choose the new Sensodyne Repair and Protect Deep Repair. No a health scoop deep repair of sensitive teeth. It's really different and effective. With it, people with sensitive teeth won't miss out on life's happy moments. Okay, don't miss out on life's happy moments. Huh? <laughs> Alright, okay, so he's going to take different sizes of tubes. These are glass tubes, huh? Three different widths. First, he's going to put the biggest, the tube with the biggest diameter onto the surface of the water. And watch as the water begins to climb up. He's doing nothing at the top. It's just climbing up by itself. This is the power of the stickiness of water. When water is cohesive and is adhesive to the sides, it can actually climb. Then he takes a smaller tube. Watch what happens when you take a smaller tube. Climb much higher. Again, no additional forces at play. Just good old hydrogen bonding uh, sticking to the sides. And then you take a super fine glass tube. I actually don't know how these tubes are made. I've tried searching online to buy such tubes. It's extremely expensive. I don't even know how one would package this and send them over. Okay, so this extremely fine tube. Then we think to the xylem. Xylems are microscopic. Think about it, huh? They are microscopic. You have to under the microscope, then you can start to see the small little channels that they flow through, right? Last week when we were searching. Think about that. If you were to insert a microscopic xylem in the presence of water, that capillary action is just even more powerful. That's the power of the first uh, mechanism. Capillary action. The larger the tube, the, the lower the water climbs. But the smaller the tube, the higher it climbs. And imagine when we are working with xylem vessels, it will climb pretty high and pretty fast too. Yes? The meniscus downwards or upwards? Oh, but the meniscus downwards or upwards. Let me think that it should be downwards as usual. It Whether it's up or down, it depends on the liquid, I believe. Yeah, I, my physics is a bit limited. Okay, but you call it means to regards to the water. Hey, regards to the liquid. Something that will point outwards is mercury, right? But not your sure Yeah. Okay. So first thing, capillary action. Smaller the diameter, the the higher the water is able to climb through the tube. What is capillary? When we see the word capillary, it's re often referring to very, very fine tubes. You know of capillary in your blood vessels, right? You know when we use the word capillary, it's also for very fine tubes. One cell thing. 
right? Hey, no, capillary is not one cell thing. Is it one cell thing? It's made of the walls are one cell thing. Okay, that's the first mechanism that allows water to move up. Apparently, for trees, along the xylem vessel, sometimes the water column may just break halfway as it's going up and then suddenly just snap, you know, the water column. So apparently, if you go up the trees and then you like listen in, right, you can actually hear sometimes little pops, pops, pops. That's because the water column, right, cannot sustain itself across the entire column. And sometimes along the way, they may snap into two water columns as it's going up. Sometimes you may hear the little pops as you listen into trees. It's not during recess time, you go and hug the trees. Put your ear there. <laughs> Let's see if you can hear it. Okay, that's the first um, mechanism. Second one, transpiration pool. Okay, I will skip straight to this last video first. Um, last week, as we're looking under microscopes, everyone was searching for this coffee bean-like structure, right? Okay. Okay, do um, you know what these coffee bean like structures are? Okay, gut cells to mata. Okay, I just need to check. Uh, did you learn this in primary school? Oh, you did? Okay, did you learn about gut cells in primary school? Oh, you did? Oh, you learned how to identify. Okay, it's those cute, like, bean shaped structures, right? Have you seen gut cells opening and closing before? It's the cutest thing ever. You don't ask me why I Google all these things on YouTube, huh? Uh, Cut cells, stomata Okay, so here's an example of a gut cell. Uh, two gut cells with a lot of chloroplasts. Okay, wrong video. Boy better than us, huh? <laughs> okay, and you can see the stomata right in the middle. Okay, so stomata is not a thing, it is just an opening. Yeah? Like, like our mouth is an opening. Right then, oh okay, then it's like lips up. Okay? So top lip, bottom lip, and then ah you open up. Right? So if you want to let, if you want a plant wants to let gases in and out or water vapor in and out, it's open up. Right? And then you'll close when it doesn't want to. I like to think of the stomata as like the nostrils of the leaf. Ah, this one, this one. Okay, yes. I think we should explore new solutions. Grab any suggestions. Catch me. Ah, your YouTube premium. Okay, this video is pretty good. You can watch the stomata close in real time. Okay? Can you see it's slowly closing? Yeah? So what's happening? Yeah, just for your information, how the gut cells are able to bend to open and close the stomata is all down to osmosis and water potential. When there's more water inside the gut cells, it will start to bend. When there's less water, it will start to unbend. Okay, and this is an example of a stomata that's closing. And where do you find most of these stomata? You find a lot of them on the underside of leaves. And you find less of them on the top side of leaves. I want to hazard a guess why. Lose less water, reduce evaporation. Logical? Yeah, actually that's the main reason why. Imagine all these nostrils open up, right? Face up to the sky. So a lot of water is gonna come out from the leaves. Yeah? Or you you open your mouth to the sky. I think it's quite a different feeling, huh? You feel thirsty when you open your mouth to the sky. My father-in-law once opened his mouth in the sky. And then a bird flew past. <laughs> and you know what happened next? He had to wash his mouth thoroughly. <laughs> okay. I still remember, I haven't got a bird sheet on my head for very long already. But then when I was in primary school, I saw this 
patch of ground that was very white. Then I was very curious, oh, why is it so white? Then I walked there and then immediately pop and never got Okay, so you find a lot of stomata on the bottom side of leaves. And I like the, that we brought up the word evaporation. At the end of the day, water can leave the leaves via evaporation. Some on the top, some on the bottom, but mostly from the bottom side of the leaves. If you ever want to experience this, go we'll take a plastic bag, wrap it around a leaf, and then you will see the water will start to collect within the plastic bag. Because this is happening. We call this process of evaporation from the leaves transpiration. Have you seen this before in primary school also? Yeah. Oh wow, okay. Don't know what you learned in primary school nowadays. Oh, you learned transpiration before? Hey, then I'm just repeating myself, then you just want me like clown. Okay, more in depth, huh? But I think this is maybe the, the basis you learned, huh? Transpiration. So then you hear this before, like transpiration boom. Oh, okay. So it's transpiration, huh? But think about it this way. Imagine if I were to look into one of these cells over here, okay, there's a cell, and then maybe next door there's another cell, right? Each cell has a certain amount of water. If water evaporates from the cell, then you find that there's less water. Then, now here is a higher water potential, this here is a lower water potential, then water will move in to the next adjacent cell. So essentially what's happening is this, when water evaporates, it needs to pull water from innermost, from cells that are adjacent to it, a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay? As water evaporates from cells on the surface, it will need to draw water from innermost cells to replace any water that's lost. And this pooling action from adjacent cell to adjacent cell, eventually from the xylem, is called transpiration pool. Basically, water is being pulled up to replace any water that's lost from the leaves. That's what transpiration pool is. And we're going to go a little bit more in depth as we watch this video together. Plants lose large quantities of water to evaporation. To balance this loss, an equally large amount of water must be transported up the stem and absorbed through the roots. Minerals that a plant requires are transported along with the water. The current model of xylem transport, called the transpiration cohesion tension mechanism, relies on the evaporative loss of water from leaves to pull water up the plant. The process begins at the leaves. The concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere is lower than in intercellular spaces of the leaf. Because of this difference, water vapor diffuses from the intercellular spaces through the stomata to the outside air in a process called transpiration. Within the leaf blade, water evaporates from the moist walls of the mesophyll cells and enters the intercellular spaces. As water evaporates from the aqueous film coating each cell, the film shrinks back into the tiny spaces of the cell walls, increasing the curvature of the water surface and thus increasing its surface tension. The increased tension in the surface film draws more water into the cell walls, replacing that which was lost. The resulting tension in the mesophyll draws water from the xylem of the nearest vein into the apoplast surrounding the mesophyll cells. The removal of water from the veins, in turn, establishes tension on the entire column of water contained within the xylem, so that water is drawn upward all the way from the roots. Water can be pulled upward through tiny tubes because of the remarkable cohesion of water, the tendency of water molecules to stick to one another by hydrogen bonding. The integrity of the column is also maintained by the adhesion of water to the xylem walls. Overall, the narrower the tube, the greater the tension the water column can withstand without breaking. In summary, the key elements of water transport in the xylem are the transpiration of water molecules from the leaves by evaporation, the tension in the xylem sac resulting from transpiration from the leaves, and the cohesion of water molecules in the xylem sac from the leaves to the roots. At each step between soil and atmosphere, Water moves passively, requiring no expenditure of energy on the part of the plant. Right, okay, 
Okay, so to sum up, imagine this is a cell inside the leaf. As water begins to evaporate to its surface, and as the water on the surface evaporates out of the stomata, you'll find that there's less water, and this water from inside the cell needs to go out to replace any water that's on the outside. Now this, water, this cell has less water, so water needs to replace water that was lost. Then this cell will have less water, it needs to replace water that's lost. And so the xylem ends up pulling a lot of water back into the leaves. That's essentially what this pooling force is. Okay? Therefore, if you want to think about it, we can actually control how fast our plants are able to pull water up. If we can control how fast this happens, among each other, could you think of certain factors I could modify surrounding this plant so that I can make the plant pull water up faster? Yeah, I want this transpiration pool to be faster. Is there anything I could modify in the surrounding environment to make it go faster? Okay, we just want to make evaporation go faster, right? So any factors that we could modify to make the plant like suck up water faster? Okay, we work with one first, okay? What do you say? Reduce the humidity of plants. Okay, could I work with humidity? Possible, right? If the humidity is low, technically, um, water would evaporate more. Okay, that's one factor. Next thing you say, okay? Make the sun hotter. Okay, could we make the sun hotter? Yeah. No, we can't. No. But, but the idea, okay, could we alter the temperature? Okay, if the temperature is higher, rates of evaporation will be higher too. Possible? Any other factors we could adjust so the evaporation will be much faster? Sorry? Wind. Possible? Wind. Hey, what am I doing? Now we just have to list all the factors of evaporation. Wind. How come you all are going to do this? Is this in physics or something? Uh, yeah. Oh, it's in physics? Uh? Factors that affect evaporation. Oh, okay. <laughs> wind. Okay, so if there's a lot of wind. Yeah, it's primary school stuff. Wow, okay, I don't know why you're in primary school is this. If there's a lot of wind, actually this has placed more the humidity also. If there's a lot of wind, you blow away all the water vapor, then that region is also low humidity. Okay, then physics, any more factors? Right, okay, so you could play with surface area. If you increase the surface area or you decrease the surface area, it will affect evaporation also, right? If you... What is one way to reduce surface area for water to leave the leaves? You what? Okay, could you take the leaves? Like you block out the stomata? Oh, possible, right? You take the leaves up. Okay, but actually plants are smarter than that. Okay, you don't need to have a tip. Instead, the plants can open and close their stomata. So that's why the opening and closing is for. If they are losing too much water, they could close it. Yeah? So open and close the stomata. That can affect the amount of uh, nostrils open. Okay? So I'm glad you all are connecting what we learned in physics to this part of it. Here. Okay, to end up today's lesson, one last factor that allows water to travel up the plant is called root pressure. This is not a very difficult concept. Uh, I'll just show it to you. Uh. If I have a beaker, and here I have a tube. Okay, this tube, the walls of the tube is semi-permeable. Have you ever done experiments with a whisking tube? It's like this, like transparent sock. They needed to fill stuff inside in high hole pants. Never do it before? Never do it before, okay. So, imagine this is a tube that is permeable. It's not like your test tube, right? your test tube last tube is not permeable. Imagine this is permeable, and imagine inside here, I have salt water. Outside over here, I have plain water. Can you explain, can you tell me what will happen to this water level over here? Okay, go up, go down. Go up, right? Via what process? Osmosis, right? Okay, let's bring in the words of water potential. Out here, water potential is 
Hi, right? So hi, WP. Then inside is low, WP. Then water will move in, and you'll find that the water level in here will rise. Plants are able to do something very similar. Plants do something to their xylems. They do this. As they are absorbing water, they are also absorbing a lot of solutes. Salts, mineral salts. You probably heard this in primary school. But the plants are quite smart. They will load all the solutes into the xylem. Essentially making the xylem very, very salty. Not in that way. Yeah. So the water, okay, so high solute concentration. Then you'll find the water potential, low water potential. So plants are quite ingenious, they employ the same forces at play. With this very salty xylem, high solute, low water potential, this helps to draw more water in. More water will want to flow in via the simple process of osmosis. From high to low water potential. After all, inside the soil, okay, inside the soil over here, is high water potential. I mean, depending on whether you water the plant or not. You water a plant, it's a different story. So, this example over here is trying to illustrate what plants do. Plants load itself on the inside with a lot of ions and mineral salts. Then, this helps to draw more water in. And we call this pressure that forces water in as root pressure because it happens at the roots. Okay. And then, today we'll get a mental break ready. Okay, so we stop here. Tomorrow we'll talk about how the food moves. Can we spend some time now consolidating your notes? And also try describing to your partner, someone around you, number one, how water gets into the xylem, and number two, how water travels up the plant. See if you can verbalize this to your partner. Uh, use all the vocabulary that has been uh, thrown out today. Right? Uh, practice talking about it, and then I think that's a good summary for yourself. Okay? Alright, so the remaining time now, you can touch up your notes. Maybe one day you'll bring a stethoscope You just plug in and like listen to different parts of the tree Yes So, 
explains why things move up a small level. Why does it move up? Because you know, they are you put the water molecules there, they they not only stick to each other, they also stick to the sides. So when they stick to the side, they end up climbing. Just for fun, um, this video tries to explain why you may hear clicks inside trees, and it's very related to transpiration pool that we just talked about. Sorry? Right, I also don't know. If the water column breaks, right, I don't know how the tide recovers from that. Walking in the forest, we can observe nice green trees. Some of them die.
Okay, so um, if you can complete this particular tab of the SLS, this one more column just to uh, quick check on if you understand you know what the implications of group pressure are. How might you change the water level? Okay, and then we're done for today. You can take a short break. You can go for a toilet break if you want to before the lesson or so. Yeah, okay. I'm good, okay, first the job is coming out, I always panic.